hopefully none of you guys here are too knowledgeable because this is really just kind of an introduction to parallel. There's nothing extremely advanced in this. And generally this is more about how you program for an FPGA rather than C or Java. There's some very subtle differences. Also, there is so much information out there regarding FPGAs, there is no way that I know it all. So just to give you guys a caveat, I am a noob in the world of FPGAs. You guys are hyper losers. <laughs> so why are you here? Um, you guys need to learn how to control FPGAs. It's cool. They can do really fast things. And a lot of you guys might have been made averse to that by a certain class called 281. <laughs> Is that true? Yes. You kind of get through that class. Um, maybe you do the homework, maybe you don't. But either way, you're not really doing anything with the language um, other than simulating it, so it's no fun. And as we all know, looking LEDs is the reason why we're electrical engineers or computer engineers or whatever. <laughs> so, um, so if you guys want to end, I can take questions about some of the special features regarding FPGAs. If it's interesting to anyone. In general, the inside of an FPGA is kind of a fabric of a bunch of different logic elements. And each of those logic elements are is kind of like this grouping that's designed to do a certain task. Um, it's a very generalized type of thing, and each of those logic elements can be connected however you want. You know? But the real issue here is that when you're coding, your code has to fit into those logic elements. And there are certain ways that, I guess, your code will fit nicely into them and will not fit nicely into them. And that's very dependent on the FPGA architecture that you're using. For instance, the Altera Cyclone FPGAs actually have four input lookup tables inside them, whereas the Spartan 6 has six input uh, lookup tables. The difference for that being that if you design a register that's controlled by more than four signals, then that design becomes verbose inside a cycle where it has to do some crazy stuff to make that work. Whereas for a Spartan 6, if you do some kind of register that's controlled by more than six, or more than four if statements, but less than six, it's all right, you know? Your design's gonna fit in an appropriate way. Um, so that's the inside of an FPGA. The outside of the FPGA is kind of like this uh, multiplex input thing where every single input can do a lot of different functions. Uh, for instance, the normal type of digital signal that you guys are used to seeing is single end signals. But they're also capable of a lot of other stuff, like differential signals um, for very high speed IO. Um, so this is kind of a list of what's out there for FPGAs that are cheap, if you guys ever want to design a board with them. Um, Altera's FPGA line that are less than like over $100 or so. Uh, are the Cyclone 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, some of what I tell you might not be that applicable um, because I've recently been working with Xilinx tools and not Altera tools. But uh, differences that I've observed between the two low-cost FPGAs out there in this performance range are that Altera's, Altera FPGAs have really nice PLLs. Xilinx does not, but they've got some other fast stuff, which I need personally. Do you elaborate on PLLs, what they are and what they do? Yeah, if you guys want to go over that at the end, that's okay. Um, in general, a PLL is a black box that takes in a frequency and produces a frequency that is phase locked, PL, um, to the incoming frequency through some multiplication or division. For instance, you could put 50 megahertz into a PLL and get a phase locked 100 megahertz signal that essentially lines up every other signal um, to your incoming. You can also do uh, some weirder division stuff where you produce like a 66.6 .6 megahertz signal from a 50 megahertz by multiplying it by four and dividing by three. There's some cool stuff like that. Um, some people miss, some people underestimate how fast they can operate stuff inside an FPGA. 50 megahertz is what is the uh, clock that you guys have on the DEO board. But really, the fabric of the FPGA can operate at much higher frequencies fairly easily. 200 megahertz is pretty much the limit for stuff going on inside a Cyclone 3. Um, if you're doing complicated stuff like comparing, multiplying, 
probably 150 megahertz, maybe 100 megahertz is appropriate. On the outside, though, in terms of the differential standards that the IOs can accept, they can do really fast stuff. Um, the Altera Cyclones uh, differential standards for getting data into the FPGA and clocking data out you can do 740 megabits per second. And the Xilinx Spartan 6 can do a gigabit per second. Um, so now we're getting closer to the stuff you're really here for because you probably don't care about actual FPGAs and just kind of do your 301. Um, but in general, there's, oh God, um, there's uh, two different ways that you can design for an FPGA, two different <coughs> ways in which you can create, um, I guess, visualizations of your logic. There's HDL coding languages like Verilog and VHDL. There's schematic design. Both of them have things that make them better than the other in some ways, but uh, for the most part, designing top level things with schematics is the appropriate way to do it, whereas designing very specific things with Verilog is easier to do. Um, wiring up a bunch of different wires for your giant shift register or whatever is never any fun. One barrel log that's like four, di four different words maybe, like hundred letters or something. Um, so some basic things about barrel log is it didn't actually originate um, as something intended to ever be synthesized as a real piece of hardware. Originally it was designed to simulate ASICs, um, like ICs, stuff like that. So someone later was like, hey, we've got this language, you know. Why don't we make it work for actual synthesis? Um, and that's created some of the confusion regarding Verilog, because it has different contexts in which you can use it. For instance, there's simulation context, um, like test benches and such, and there's synthesis context. Um, some code that you'll put in a synthesis block, like delays and stuff, will actually end up in simulation-based code, but won't end up there in your synthesis code, unless, of course, those delays happen to match up with the actual hardware delays inside the FPGA. <laughs> um, so how is Verilog different? Um, normally when you're programming in C or Java, you know, you're creating instructions. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. You know, your CPU handles one thing at a time. And if you get verbose with that, put a lot of stuff, give the CPU a lot of stuff to do, you know, it'll do it all. Um, that's not so much the case with FPGA design. If you give your FPGA too much stuff to do in the allotted time, it just won't do it. You know, you get timing hackers. Bad stuff happens. Um, so the real thing to understand is that when you put a line of code there, like this equals this times this divided by this, that whole ha that all has to end up in hardware somehow. So being mindful of what you're doing is the appropriate way to go when you're coding this stuff. So. This is the beginning of kind of the code stuff, I guess. Um, a Verilog module is kind of like the basic tool that you guys use to create classes or blocks. Um, and a module is just something that contains inputs or outputs. It's pretty standard, right? Kind of like a class. Weird, weird way. Um, here we've got the syntax here that declares the module as that name, single light set. Oh, yeah, to give you guys a, uh, Preview here. You guys have all done the T-Bird tail light demo or something in 281, or you didn't do it, but were assigned it, right? <laughs> yeah, so I've actually coded that up here as a demonstration for you guys. So here we're creating that kind of uh, state machine for that one of those tail lights, just one of those like flashing light things. And of course, the modules end with end module. <laughs> The modules are always ended up with end, mod end module. Verilog's kind of weird in that they don't like the mustaches, the little braces and stuff. Um, they like to begin in the end statements to replace those, which ends up being a lot of text and harder to read, but it is what it is, unfortunately. Okay. So one of the big confusions with Verilog is that there's this thing called a blocking assignment, and there's thi this thing called a non-blocking assignment. Um, the real difference here is that this behaves like you'd expect any code to behave, you know, where this statement must happen 
uh, before this statement or your, com your uh, compiler will optimize it somehow to get it to work out the proper way. A non-blocking statement is that these happen simultaneously. And that's probably one of the things that you guys have heard about Marilog in terms of the way it's characterized, that everything happens at once. That's not true in all cases. You can code with the blocking assignments as long as you're mindful of how you're doing it. It does lead to more verbose code in a lot of cases. Um, so you have to be careful. A lot of times you'll use blocking statements when you have an index that you're incrementing then operating with that index. Another thing that you can't do is you gotta pick one. You can't mix these two statements. Because what's it gonna do? Like execute all the non-blocking statements and figure out how to do the blocking assignments. It's it's confusing for a compiler. Your job's hard enough. So just like we have types in Java and C, right, we have types in Verilog. And these generally fall into two different categories. One of them is called a net type. And a net type is a wire. Um, well, a wire is the type of a net. Um, but can any, of you tell, can any of you tell me what the state of a wire is? Is it a high or a low? You don't know, right? It's a wire. It has no logic. Right. So a wire is something that has to be driven. It's an input to your block. You know, it, it doesn't know what it is. It has to be told. A register is something that actually contains a state. And with different types of registers, here I've got integer down as the most common one people use. By default, both a wire and a register are interpreted as unsigned. Um, so if you wire two barrel lock blocks together with the output of one being a signed value and the output of the, the input of another being an unsigned value, your compiler is not going to know that you did that. You're going to interpret the signed value as an unsigned value over here. Then you get negative numbers, they end up being really big, you don't know why, you know. No good. Um, so here I've just got an example of the syntax um, for declaring something. Signed wire, signed reg. Generally working unsigned is safer, easier to do. If you do need to use signed for something, be mindful of it, be careful. And you guys have presumably been using the Altera tools. So in Verilog, there's a bus modifier. Um, and that's seen in the syntax here that looks kind of like an array, right? Maybe, I don't know. But it's not. A little tricky like that. And what this is declaring, actually, is that the out there's actually three light outputs. Um, index 2, 1, and 0. And here we've got got a count register that's declared as 7 through 0, so 8 total wires coming out of that register. And something I didn't include in this presentation, but I should probably tell you now um, that we're here, is that there are arrays in Verilog, right? So if this is how you define a bus, how do you define an array? You know? And it's kind of annoying. You actually declare it by putting the brackets over here. So as you can think, as you can see, that could easily get confusing, where you could have register seven through zero, and then array seven through zero over here. So then you have an array of eight registers with eight wires coming out of them each. And one property of an array in Verilog is that normally, like this, you can access count of seven. So if I just had reg count bracket seven, I can access that individual wire. But if I had an array, I can't access that individual wire. I have to access each array value as the whole value. I guess you could do bit masking or something. I've never done that before. But it might work. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm confused. So like you say you can you can call up an individual wire like by the bracket mode afterwards, right? Yeah. Um, so if you wanna if you make an array, you cannot call up a specific individual array block or yeah, so uh, seven three zero. Is that like visible? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, somewhat. So this is what I was talking about before with an array. Um, some of you might think that you actually have two hundred and fifty five array values right here. <coughs> you don't. Know, you actually have eight. It's a little bit different. Um, it's a little bit different than how the uh, how the actual wire value is. So be mindful of that. It's confusing. 
And then for this guy, if I did count of seven equals zero, what does that mean? It doesn't, certainly doesn't mean that the uh, seventh or the eighth bit of every single count register is going to equal zero. What that means is that the seventh count array value is going to equal zero. So the entire eight bit value, that's the seventh, or the eight, sorry, not seventh, but eighth. Eighth index in the array is going to equal entirely zero. But if I come over here and delete this, uh, now the seventh wire of count is zero. It's a little confusing. You guys see that? It's obnoxious. I've made that mistake before. It's frustrating. And like your program doesn't crash gracefully like it does in an operating machine. It's in an FPGA and the FPGA doesn't scream when it dies. <laughs> <laughs> so when your design doesn't work, you know, on a computer, it crashes. Something is clearly, clearly wrong. Um, and maybe you can find out where it crashed, you know, FPGA, not the case. You don't know what happened. Um, if you guys are in 301, Later, Ed will tell you about an onboard debugging tool that you guys can use, which is pretty sweet. So you can actually kind of get an oscilloscope inside your FPGA and look at the internal registers pretty quickly. But that's for later. If you want to explore on your own signal tap, you might be able to look that up. Um, so it would be valid code, I believe. I'm not sure I'd ever do this. I don't know why. Don't know why. <laughs> it would be valid code if you wanted to say register count equals um, equals something, you know, your initial value there. I've seen that done. My habit has always been to use an initial block as seen here. What an initial block is essentially sets up all your registers before your code ever executes. This is what your registers start as. Um, so here I've got light is assigned to be zero with a non-blocking assignment and count is assigned to be zero with a non-blocking assignment. And then here you also see the other ways of declaring a uh, value in uh, Verilog. Like you can declare, declare stuff as binary and hexadecimal just as you can do with certain C compilers. Um, some C compilers don't like binary, some do. Yeah. Initial blocks. You can always begin and end with the mustaches. You gotta use them. Um, so the real workhorse of Verilog is the always block. Um, so generally you're making some kind of machine that's synchronous to some kind of edge, correct? You've got a clock, you know, everyone loves clocks. And at that always block, you can declare something like always at positive edge of clock. And this clock is going to, this block over here is going to execute every time your clock comes along and says, hey, do something. And you can also do negative edge of clock, just Neg edge, pretty straightforward. Um, you can pull off some other nonsense too if you want to. A lot of times when you have, uh, like you see a counter, you know, and you want an asynchronous clear on that counter, a lot of times you'll see people do something along the lines of this, or You'll see this. So then they'll have an if statement inside the uh, always block, like if reset, which means it's an asynchronous reset event that clears stuff. That's the technique you can use. I've never done it. I've heard people call it dangerous. I don't know why, but I've never found a need for it. Okay. Um, another thing that people really, like I haven't seen anyone really doing this too much is Verilog actually has a preprocessor preprocessor in kind of a limited way where you can create defined statements. And this is mostly for readability, as you can see over here. You got a little dash over here, define state dormant equals zero. Um, is anyone not familiar with preprocessor um, in C? Okay. Um, what this is going to do is every time you see this state dormant, the preprocessors are going to go in and replace state dormant with whatever number you've assigned it to be. So it just makes your code more readable. So when you're assigning states to this register, 
they're not just state zero, state one, state two, they're meaningful. You can actually keep track of what you're doing. It's easy to get lost in the nested statements. So the other real amazing tool of Verilog, not really Verilog, but all programming languages, but in general Verilog, is the case statement. The people who design FPGAs actually design it in mind, actually have it in mind that you're going to be using case statements in your functions. So most of the logic blocks or slices that are inside the FPGA have these multiplexes that are designed for this purpose. So they're a real good thing to use. They produce efficient code. Um, in this case, what we're doing is we have a state variable, right? We saw before that we've declared our state variable, right? And we have different states associated with it. Uh, we generally have a state machine, something like that. Some of you might have thought I was about to draw a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Not the case. <laughs> And you'll have it transitioning from state to state. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, just put back back. Maybe. Hmm. That's such a better time. Trying to get out of the way here. Now you're moving from state to state. What you do with the case statement is you can create essentially these blocks of code. So your Verilog program knows, all right, I'm in this state now. What conditions do I need to be listening for to exit the state and move to the next one? And that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing this case statement evaluating this state. And if it sees the state, it's going to go to the corresponding section of code. And within that code, you can have a statement that's something like, if this condition, state is going to equal state dormant or state flashing, either or. And with this, you can create complex state machines. It's pretty sweet, easy to look at, nice. And especially about cases, there is no mustache begin thing. There is an end case though, and that's just specific. You'd think they'd be consistent with it and just go begin end, but apparently not. Apparently case statements are super special. And finally, this is a state oh no. This is a state machine um, with the code actually in there. Um, so as you can see here, we have our first state here. You guys can see my mouse thing. We have the first state here, and when it comes along, if we see the input to the module, which was light active, if we see that go high, that means we have to make a state transition to the next state. And we have to modify the state variable so that the next time a positive edge of the clock comes along, this, it'll read the state variable and go to the proper section of code, in this case being state flashing. Um, so within state flashing, we've got another set of code if you guys want to actually read through this, you can. I was going to do a handout, but maybe we can do an email um, with the full code for the state machine. It's easy to design stuff off of it. This is kind of the paradigm or the template that I use for pretty much everything that I do. So whenever you're designing a state machine, it's always got a state variable. Sometimes it's got a count variable. You know, They're always making transitions. So it's a pretty useful tool. It's a pretty useful design template. And this is what uh, the Altera compiler actually did. Oh God. Huh. This is what the Altera compiler actually did with our code. It created this monstrosity. Obviously, it has no sense of how to make wires pretty. But still, <laughs> if you're suspicious about what your code is doing, you can come in here and look at it. Generally, this is called an RTL view. Um, if you're googling about how to get to it, and yeah. I think this is our state multiplexer here, maybe? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe this one. I don't know. Um, yeah. That's all I have. If there's questions, please let me know. Do you guys want to hear anything about FPGA specifically, not Verilog or Verilog? You guys, you guys feel like you can write Verilog now? Maybe? Probably a little better. A lot better than you used to. Case statements. Yeah, they're um, certainly. Yeah, bit shifting. That's your friend. <laughs>
So what you're saying, I'm still a little confused about the array and the wire thing. I always just use the wires and create the bus with the wires and specify. So when I said equals, it equals like that wire equals whatever value I say, right? Now, well, if you make like the array thing on it, does that mean each wire then has eight values on that wire? Yeah. Um, like, because you like, I don't know, draw, like, so then how do you, you can, can you reference all of your eight wires then, like, specifically on all eight bits on each eight wires then? Like, how would you call those then? Like, if you're trying to set a specific bit on a specific wire? You can't. Okay. Um, that's the trouble. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> maybe you could do with bit masking. Um, if you guys are familiar with that, count equal, let's say count seven, equals count the n and the zero b right so what this would do is it and the two count in that registry you made right there together and the fifth bit would actually be set high if it's not already so that might be a way to do it I don't know if that actually complies You want to go there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Never mind. Yeah, yeah. it could get dangerous. Pipe. Pipe. So, you want to become so. Let's use the board this time. Wait, what if oh, you yeah, count yeah, they to go seven and you count seven more? Yeah, 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 yeah sorry. Um, when you're using the term wires and you're using a register here, if I try to say... Okay, yeah. well, whatever. Like, uh, yeah. I, I, I think of it as like a bus. Yeah. Um, a wire specifically, if I were to say wire count seven, you create a set of inputs that's an array, you know, but you're not going to be able to assign anything to them. Um, that's the problem with wires. They have no state. They can't do anything on their own. They have to be written. So this would throw an error that says like you cannot like left-handed side of expression in the world of law. So would you recommend using registers instead of wires almost always? Well, you have to use wires for your inputs, and okay. pretty much any variable that you're working with mm -hmm. will be a register. Um, okay. The register is part of the group of types in Verilog that are called variables because you can't use them like variables. And there's like integer, parameter, some other stuff. Um, but registers are pretty much the go-to for variables. Um, wires are just inputs. Well, don't you just define input as just input, whatever? Yeah, and it'll implicitly define it as a wire. I like writing it, but it'll implicitly define it as a wire, and outputs are implicitly defined as registers, depending on your compiler. So say you wanted to count like 400 clock pulses, you would just use a counter, almost as in an assembly language. Yeah. Um, this is not an always block, so this is meaningless. Mm -hmm. you know, this is never going to execute. OK. Um, let's make this less confusing. Um, another thing we don't have in Verilog <coughs> is you can't do count equal count plus plus. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, it'd be nice if they could just infer that, but they don't. Um, so here, just count equals count plus one. Um, if count equals whatever your count value is, change state, whatever. Okay. Can you just walk us through your code? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I was going to give a handout. Um, unfortunately, that never happened. Um, you can still put that on the website after yeah. you're done. Fortunately, yeah, sure. we have the internet. Um, so here, I showed you guys the initial module statement. That's where you declare <coughs> all your inputs and outputs to your block. Um, here we have a couple different inputs. Clock, right? You need that. Otherwise, you need some edge to do something at, or you need to create combinational logic that's not actually registered just perpetually assign something. And we also have the output of light. Oh, actually, I've got this up here. I can show you guys the sweet keeper tail lights. And then we come down here, and we just redeclare, not redeclare, but we declare a state register. 
You have to have some way of knowing what state you're in. The way to do that is to have a register to do it. And you don't have to do this by any means, but it's nice to have defined statements just to make your code readable. So when you see a uh, state equals zero, you're not confused about what that means. And it's easier to modify this way. I could actually do this if I want. There's no reason to have that as a two-bit register. And then we have an initial statement. And here we define initially our state is going to be zero, or state dormant, which is corresponding to state zero. And our light output is going to be zero, so all lights off. And finally, you've got the real workhorse here. And that's going to be the always block. So whenever the positive edge clock comes along, we're going to come into this uh, block of code right here. It's going to see that case statement and be like, oh, what should I do? What state am I in? And it's going to go to the correct state. Um, in the case of being dormant, we are going to just check the input of light active. You guys following me? Yeah. I'm just going to check the input of light active. Now, if we see that, we can change state. Uh, and uh, the first light has to go high. Um, just because that's the way it was for this particular piece of code. And then, now that the state's modified, it's not like you're going to go to the next uh, case statement. There aren't break statements in Verilog, um, like there are in C and C++. It's kind of obnoxious when you don't put it in and you don't realize it. Um, so we're not going to go to the next <coughs> state immediately. It's going to have to go do a full another cycle and we're going to have to see the next edge and then it's going to come into flashing. In flashing, all we're going to do is wait until we came into the flashing block with the third light being high. When we came into the block, into the, this block with the third light being high, then we know we're done. We've gone through all our T bird tail lights. I should really just show you guys a demonstration so this makes some sense. So here, our hazard lights, right? Yeah, <laughs> pretty sweet, blinking lights. Left turn signal. Yeah. <laughs> Light turn signal. <laughs> yeah. um, I should have actually brought in my oscilloscope from last year. Um, <laughs> it, it basically did the same thing, but with like RGB and like PWM light amounts, so it was like a rainbow gay thing. <laughs> um, it was probably the most fun barrel I've ever had. <laughs> um, anyways, so all we're doing is, and that second light was already high when we came into that block, we're just going to change state down here <coughs> and go back to the dormant state and turn off all the lights. Um, over here, this operator is when the second light wasn't high, we've got to uh, we've got to move the light string down. So on here, you can see that it starts with the first light, and then we just move the light string down and set them high as we go out. And then we've got to set that LSB to be high. There's probably better ways to do this. Easier, perhaps, I don't know. Um, bit shifting is nice, it's easy. Bit shifting is really easy for your hardware to actually implement. There's just a pipeline register that you just have to clock, and you're clocking bits into it. So it implements this really efficient code. If you can use it, use it. For serial communication, is awesome. Um, for people with serial one. There's also a, uh, a shifting block, if you guys want to use that. Pretty straightforward. And yeah, you just have to wrap it up, end case, and end your always block, and end monitor. <laughs> so yeah, we can't post this good on the website. Not that it's incredibly complex, but it's a good template. <laughs> so do you have this module inside of a block diagram? Or I do, or but. Um, it's, I implement, I export it into a block diagram. Um, if I was using my computer, I would show you guys, but if not, it's not too bad. Um, if you guys don't know how to instantiate a Verilog block in Altera, it's pretty easy. You just have to go file, create symbol or something. Is that right? And then uh, create symbol. And that tries to compile it and then generates the block. Any other questions?